This time on the Highland Woodworker, we're back. An all new season starts with a moment with master woodworker, author, and teacher, Doug Stowe. And he said to me, uh, Doug, I don't know why you would be studying to become a lawyer when it's so obvious to me that your brains are in your hands. Plus, He's going to teach us one of the secrets to making his world-renowned boxes. Then we're teaming up with Popular Woodworking Magazine for some tips, tricks, and techniques. Someone showed us this trick, too smart to even consider, and why didn't I think of it before? David Teal cuts to the chase with some simple solutions when it comes to working with bandsaw blades. These stories and more, this time on The Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. 40 years. That's how long Highland Woodworking has been providing the finest tools to woodworkers and the best woodworking education, if I do say so myself. Speaking of woodworking education, Doug Stowe has been teaching the craft and building beautiful furniture for decades. He invited us to one of the many workshops where he passes along his knowledge to eager students. This time, in our moment with a master, Doug Stowe. The Arkansas sun shines a spotlight on a brand new wood studio at the Eureka Springs School of the Arts located high in the Ozarks. Doug Stowe is inside getting ready for another chance to teach. Some of his students are young and some are not, but they all get to learn and benefit from his hands-on approach to teaching the craft. Anaxagoras, who was one of the first Greek philosophers, said man is the wisest of all animals because he has hands. I ask people, uh, think about something that you learned that had a really deep impact on you. And one of the things that, um, that I usually find true is that they were there doing something real. And when we think about hands-on, that's what we're describing. We're describing something where you actually took part in, in the discovery. When you do something that's real, you don't have to have a teacher tell you whether or not you did a good job. Doug is a phenomenal furniture maker and his portfolio covers the entire spectrum, from elegant to rustic and everything in between. He even teaches you how in book and video form, but it's his signature pieces that always keep him thinking outside the box. More on those later. His inspiration for woodworking came early in life. You could say he became a product of his environment. I grew up in a household full of antiques that were mainly inherited from my Aunt Aline, who um, just collected stuff, you know, and so it was mainly pretty fine furniture. With that household of antiques, I had the chance to see how things were made and see and be exposed to different kinds of joinery and that kind of thing, even though you wouldn't necessarily look at it and say, well, that's a this or this is a that. You would say, that's well made, and you could look at some of the details. And then um, my earliest recollection of my father was being instructed how not to hit my fingers with the hammer and so we were always doing things. And of course the icing on the cake for me in terms of shifting my career direction was when I was in high school, I restored a, a 1930 Model A Ford. And the, the man who was helping me with it was, was a true craftsman. And I went home from college uh, to visit at one point and I was kind of frustrating with all the academic stuff. And he said to me, uh, Doug, I don't know why you would be studying to become a lawyer when it's so obvious to me that your brains are in your hands. I was given kind of an advantage in that little phrase that my brains were in my hands because it, it made me really observe my hands and it made me see the way that my hands shifted the way I thought. What was your first woodworking project? I was really there for the very first uh, round of skateboards when they became popular in the very first place, which meant that you took a pair of skates apart and you built a board and you attached 
the trucks from under the original skate. And you were in Nebraska? I was in Nebraska. and I, I was, was in Georgia, and we did the same thing. You did? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I took yeah. a whole bunch of different colors of wood, and I put them together and cut out the shape, and uh, yeah. so that was one of my first, uh, first projects. And fortunately, my father, uh, working in the, as manager of hard, hardware store at the time, uh, had access to replacement wheel sets to go on yes. the bottoms of roller so. skates. <laughs> well, that, that's great. Um, now, your preparatory education, you went to college? And yeah, I went to college. I um, also in Nebraska. I graduated from Hastings College in Nebraska, a small Presbyterian school. Mm -hmm. And so I was there celebrating the first Earth Day and then had become amazed that we would celebrate Earth Day at that time, that many years ago, and then have done so little about really cherishing the planet that we live upon. Sure. In relation to all that, you know, I, I believe woodworking is an environmental art, even though we're using trees. We can use the trees in a way that educates people as to the value of our natural world. Back to those beautiful boxes that I told you we would get to. Doug has made countless of them in all different shapes, sizes, and wood species. For me, the, um, the box making was something to do when I didn't have a furniture commission. Yeah. And it's to have something where I could stockpile work and then sell it to galleries and stuff. Um, so if I, did, if I wasn't making something for someone, I was able to make, just go ahead and make boxes. And, uh, and so I started selling them in galleries. And, and then, um, uh, but I had a line of boxes. You know, I didn't really branch out very far from what I was making as a way of supplementing my income uh, until I was asked to write about box making and then that, um, you know, you can't have a single project in a book with 16 chapters. You've got to have 16 different boxes in it. That's right, yes. And uh, so that, that forced me to uh, consider other kinds of joinery, um, shape sizes, inlays, uh, all kinds of things. What a beautiful collection. Tell me about this little fellow. Well, this little box was one of the first ones that I um, was making as a, as a sideline of my furniture making. And I used all of these different woods inlaid in it. That was part of my message, you know, to use the box as a way of helping people understand the beauty of the forest and the necessity of diversity. Mm -hmm. And so on the bottoms, I would write the names so it's not only a box, it's a collection of, um, of woods that help people to become better informed. So it becomes a story. It's a story, yes. And it's also, um, it's, it's a collection right here, yeah. you know. More than a box. But it, it tells people about the importance of our various woods. And I like to use woods that people wouldn't be familiar with. So this little wood right here is honey locust. And of course that's cherry and maple. But the opportunity to use different woods means that these woods aren't just being pushed aside to get the oaks or pushed aside to get the walnut. You have, you understand the value of them. Well, there are a number of things that I like about this box. One is the, the way this, this relationship here, it kind of tells you where to put your finger. And this, this is central. So I took that and I deliberately put that as a, as a focal point in the front of the box, the same way this serves. This is walnut and hickory. And, and you pinned the miters. I the miters are pinned, yes. It's mm -hmm. just a common mitered box, but that's a different mm -hmm. treatment of just using dowels to, uh, to lock the joint. And left them proud uh, to, uh, to be something to see. Yes. Yeah, it's uh -huh. texture. Um, this is... Uh, a little box that's from my book, um, Tiny Boxes. I did a whole series of little tiny boxes, but this looks like a chunk of wood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's wonderful. I have this kind of this interest in native native hardwoods. So mm -hmm. this is a reliquary of wood, and inside it are 25 different Arkansas different species of Arkansas woods. 
And so this was um, inspired by a, uh, a reliquary in a museum in Kansas City. Uh, a reliquary is where they would keep the bones of a saint or some other kind of precious object. And for me, the, um, the woods deserve that level of reverence. So this was a way of just creating a collection of wood, but also uh, to put it in a, a format that suggests that there's something important about them. Yeah, I like the way you create purpose around, uh, around something people might just see as an object. Uh, it becomes a, a way to teach. It becomes something that, that is uh, maybe more important than just a few pieces of wood. Well, I think, you know, I think that a lot of woodworkers really um, have a lot of thought behind what they're doing, but may, mm -hmm. not, uh, may not suggest as strongly as I do that it's there. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think it's, uh, so in, in that way, I, I think in the same way I'm trying to speak for the hands, I also think of speaking for woodworkers, some of the things that we take for granted and may not necessarily share with other people. But these are important things because um, if people understand the importance of what they're doing and can express it to people, maybe other people of the younger generation will start to understand what they can do with wood. What would you like for your legacy to be? I remember Doug Stowe. Yeah, I... Um, Maybe Lucy's dad. Lucy's dad. That is very interesting. Lucy must be your my daughter. Your daughter. Yeah. Lucy's you dad. Know, I'm, I think that that um, it's you, you. don't think of yourself as going away anytime soon. You know. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and yet uh, you know we we all know that that time comes and. Uh, to, you know, I have so many children at this point. You know, I mean, I've got a, I've got a high school student who, um, I taught him to whittle. You know, I, I've had these kids that are wrapped up in my life, and um, and yet my own daughter Lucy is a symbol of all of that. And I, I really believe that every child is your child. But in terms of putting a name on it, I'll say Lucy. Later in the show, Doug Stowe shows us how to cut corners when it comes to box making. But first... So how do you figure out this length quickly? Well, we've got a trick for you. Popular Woodworking's David Teal has some good pointers on some pointy things. You're watching The Highland Woodwork. I'm just an average down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably about a 5. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here. And I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw. And there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best-selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop. Highland Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading band saws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon. Power Tools.
Woodworkers count on American-made forest saw blades for smooth, quiet cuts every time, without splintering, scratching, or tear-outs. The famous Woodworker II is the all-purpose combination blade. But for special cuts, Woodworker IIs are available for cutting dovetails, for flat-bottom joinery. A 30-tooth blade is perfect for ripping, a 48-tooth blade for superior cross-cuts, and a finger-joint blade set. There is a perfect far as Woodworker II for every table saw cut. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for more than 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year-round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, just look in their catalog or go to highlandwoodworking.com. If you have a bandsaw, you got to know what size blade to buy. Sometimes it's a mystery. David Teal can help in Popular Woodworking's tips, tricks, and techniques. We're here at the Popwood shop and we've got some tricks for you. We're going to start with a bandsaw trick. Actually, bandsaw blade trick, and we've really got two of them for you today, so this is fun. First off, we're going to show you how, a fast way to figure out how long this blade is. Why do you need to know that? Well. Sometimes you've got a couple of different saws. You need to figure out which blade goes on which saw. If you're reordering and you're not sure of the length, you need to know that number too. Maybe you've got a friend who's gifting you with some of his blades, but you don't know if it's going to fit your saw. So how do you figure out this length quickly? Well, we've got a trick for you. First off, you want to take the blade and make it a little smaller. I've got my gloves on to protect my hands. Go ahead and twist it up. And we'll make it easier to work with. So, you might have noticed somewhere along the line, that trying to fold a blade into an even number of loops isn't going to happen. It's always an odd number of loops. In this case, it's three, and that works fine. Get them pretty much as tight as you can, and we're going to measure the diameter. Take your roll, and you don't have to be dead on. We want to get close. You can see and check, make sure you're actually at the diameter. Give it a little bit of a push. Uh, I don't know. I might call this 13 and a quarter which is going to be okay. We can use that. The more accurate is better. If you think 13 and a quarter works fine, we're going to do some math and I'm not going to make you do it in your head, which is the good thing. So let's play 13 and a quarter and we have three loops. So let's go to our, well, calculator slash phone in this case. So we've got 13.25 times three loops times pi, 3.15. 4 equals. Your bandsaw blade should be about 124 inches in length. So now that we know how long your blade is, it's time to put the new one back on the saw. And one of the things I've always tripped over is I've got my blade loose and I've got my guard off and things removed. I go to put this back on and the trick is you have to get it over the bottom wheel and then the top wheel. And I keep going back and forth fighting over, oh no, I got it on the top wheel. It came off the bottom wheel. Pain. So, Someone showed us this trick, too smart to even consider, and why didn't I think of it before? So, I'm going to take the blade, put it in the slot, get it started, and it's still hard, but we're getting closer, we got it clear. Here's the easy part. You got a couple of these in your shop? I know you do. Take this, put it on the tire, put it on the blade, put two of them on just in case. Okay, so now when I go to put that blade on that bottom wheel, it's not going to flop around and fall off the top wheel because it's held in place with those clamps. Easy, simple, make setting up your bandsaw a piece of cake and get cutting right away. All right, so that's a couple of tricks for your bandsaw from the Popwood crowd. Hope you enjoyed them. Now you can figure out the right length of your blade and a faster way and a less 
less confusing and frustrating way to put the blade back on. Hope you enjoyed it. We've got a few more tricks down the road for you. See you then. Coming up, building a box with Doug Stowe. Don't go away. You're watching The Highland Woodwork. A lot of folks say they just don't make tools like they used to anymore. I don't know, I suppose that's true in some cases. But the good stuff is still out there. I'm talking about the tools that are just a pleasure to use, that are well designed to get the job done quickly and efficiently, and are made to last so they'll get passed on to the next generation. Whatever tools my grandkids use, I know one thing, they'll be keeping them Tormek sharp. For 35 years, Lee has manufactured the world's best joinery jigs. From our award-winning dovetail jigs and mortise and tenon jigs, to newer innovations like router table jigs, easily add strong, beautiful joinery to your woodworking pieces, like half-blind dovetails, box joints, mortise and tenon joints, and through dovetails. Lee, simply the easiest and most versatile router joinery jigs. Whiteside Machine Company has been in business for over 30 years providing customers with quality American-made router bits. Fine Woodworking Magazine has declared Whiteside router bits best overall and best value when compared against 17 other brands. No matter the router application, they have the type and profile of carbide router bit you need. When you put a Whiteside router bit to work in your shop, it is guaranteed to make you smile. If you can't make it to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia, you can shop online at highlandwoodworking.com. They're great at getting what you want to your shop quick. Welcome back. Earlier in the show, we introduced you to master woodworker Doug Stowe. You may recall he gave us a tour of some of his incredible boxes. Now he is showing us the secret to building them. Take a look. Doug, you've told me about an X plus or minus two box. Is yes. that correct? Yeah. I have no idea what that is. Okay. Tell well, me about it. Okay. Show me. Uh, let me let me run off some ratios to you. Okay. Five by seven. Eight All by right. ten. All right. Six by eight. Now, the difference of two. Okay. Yes. You, uh -huh. you, you, so we're five by seven. That's a real. We see a lot of things that are five by seven. Eight by 10 might be a rug, right? Yeah, or, but, a, or a glossy picture. Or a glossy picture, but it's a very simple proportion. That's right. And, uh, and I can do a, a, a box that's X plus or minus two real easy. The first thing I'm gonna do, I've got my uh, table saw set up so it's at 45 degrees, and I check that very carefully. There are two things that can go wrong on a rectilinear box. One would be that your angle's off, which means that the miters aren't going to come together right. The other would be that if your stop block isn't uh, positioned so that you get matching parts, then one part might be longer than the other. And, and they'll not, never come and together. And they'll no, never come together. So um, I wanted this to be real simple. I'm going to take my pencil, I'm going to make a mark down there so I kind of know it's going to be easy for me to put things back together, right? So I'm going to make a cut over here. The first side, see I've got it written on there, face side down, just to remind myself. So I'm going to make my first cut face side down. The first cut was made face side down. The second cut is made face side up. So I'm going to go um, make this box five and a half by seven and a half. So you can see I can line that mark up and I can see exactly where the blade cut before. So that makes it real easy. 
and then I'll put my stop block in place. And then um, I can either make this the front of the box or I can use my spacer block in here and make that the front of but the end of a box. So let me do that. <laughs> Okay, there's an end. The front. Do another, yeah. Thank you. So, in theory, a person can just take these. Um, and then spread them out. And you can see the line goes continuous through them all the way. So you're wrapping the grain. The grain is wrapped continuously around. There will be a discontinuity right here and here. But um, I had, I have a friend, Ernie, who runs a float service, um, canoeing. And when he doesn't have any customers, he gets in his boat, his canoe, and he goes downstream with his, uh, all his painting apparatus and uh, can paint. I want it to be that easy, you know. I, I would like it to be where I can just walk to the shop and make a box as easy as that. Beautiful. And all the joints come together, all the miters. All the miters come together. And of course, again, that has to do with setting the angle correctly and then using the stop block to control the, uh, the length of the, of the parts and using my magic X plus or minus two block. That's right. So it's really simple if you know how to do it. If you know how to do it, it's very simple. And of course, you have to have a pretty good saw. You're not going to you know, you got to have one that will take an accurate angle. Sure. And you have to set it carefully. And then uh, the interesting thing is that this same block is useful when, when you're making a straight cut to form uh, a floating panel lid or the bottom. Again, it's the same ratio. The, uh, the, the size will minus be... Minus or plus two. Plus yeah. or minus two. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's great. And... Then you can do anything you want to with this box. You, you you've can, got the yeah. foundation. You've got the foundation. So I'll put, a, I'll put a floating panel top in it. I'll put a bottom in it. And then uh, I may put some keys in the corners that uh, strengthen it. And then cut the, the lid from the body of the box and put hinges on it. And there I go. And uh, the tape kind of helps you bring it all together. Yeah, the tape, you know, the, the tape... Uh, when it's, uh, when it's time to actually glue that, I can either use tape or these big rubber bands. You can buy these from Amazon, by the way. And uh, so you just get the big rubber bands and st stretch it around. And, and these will hold everything square and tight while the glue dries. That's great. And so that's how you were able to do the 800, 800 boxes. boxes and a lot of rubber bands and a lot of uh, cutting. And of course, uh, at that time, I did them all square because that made it easier. I just have to make cut, 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 cut. There, I've got a box. Hey, in this case, great. this little block makes all the difference in terms of being able to make a rectilinear box and still keep my parts in order. Yeah. Yeah. So, and with 800 boxes, you've got 800 times four, what, 3,200 parts 
You definitely want to keep them in you order. You want to keep them in order. Other, and of course, the wood that I was using was had a lot of variation to it. So mm -hmm. if you didn't get this side lined up with that side, it wasn't going to look good. In this case, um, you've got the, the line of the grain that follows all the way around the box. Well, would you like to do something that's a little more sculptural? Maybe get away from being a flat border. This is a great way to start. Spoon carving. Our friends at Narex have got another great product. Spoon carving is the rage now. You don't have to have a lot of stuff. And they've provided what you need to get started, and that's very important. You get a blank of wood to carve the spoon from. And this is very easy carving soft wood. You, you can use this. So to do it, you start out with your roughing gouge and you rough out the bowl of the spoon. And then this wonderful double-sided, double-edged uh, knife here will allow you to refine it and detail the inside of the bowl. And then to carve the handle, just like you see in this spoon, you've got a wonderful little carving knife here. You're going to like this. A set of directions comes with it. Narex has thought of everything. Spoon carving, it might be for you. Give it a try, and I guarantee you, it'll make you smile. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. That's all the time we have for the show today. But check us out on social media and come back to see us next time on the Highland Woodworker. Thank you.